that. Hello and welcome to this round six at Grand Prix Prague. I'm Tim Willoughby with Raf Levy and we have one of our Pro League players, Andre Mengucci of Italy there. He is uh, in our feature match area, aiming to make it into day two of this GP. Mengucci, he's had kind of a, a funny experience when it comes to GPs, which is that in spite of being one of the absolute top players in the game, somehow or other, he's never had a Grand Prix top eight and it's something that he would very much like to turn around here as he has a peculiarly mono black start here kicking things off with a cathodian here while andre schmetana has a deranged assistant to begin with on his blue black build a fair mix of bits and pieces that he can work with here the deranged assistant just setting up a lot of uh, cool graveyard interactions lots of them in blue black anyway and Immediately dealing with that Cathodian relatively straightforwardly there as he gets down his uh, Slum Reaper there. Each player sacrificing a creature when it comes into play. And as the only creature in play, he's looking nice on board. Yes, he's signaling he doesn't need the, the mana from the assistant with the Slum Reaper. Like he, the, he's turned uh, three Slum Reaper. Reveals that. Crow of Dark Tidings coming along from Mangucci, putting up planes in the graveyard so we get a chance to get a feel for what he's working with here. Early doors, these guys just kind of bouncing off one another a little bit. Uh, Unburial Rites going into the graveyard. That a good place for it. It's got flashback, so he'll be able to use it for four mana to get a creature back out of that graveyard. But in the meantime, Glenelendra Archmage, a nice little rare here for Shmetana. Yeah, but no, no good target for Unburial Rites, unfortunately. Just uh, the crows. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a pretty low-impact use yeah. for them. Olivia's Dragoon coming along. Now, they are a discard outlet, so if it works out that there's a very powerful mm -hmm. creature that can get discarded by Mengucci, he will be able to use that Unburial Rites to get them back once he finds a little bit of white mana. However, there's uh, Glen and Lendera. Yeah, I mean, that makes Arcanage. all of these plans involving resolving yeah. spells a lot more difficult. It, you can pay a blue and sacrifice it to negate a spell, uh, and it has Persist, so you can potentially do that a couple of times. Canker Abomination coming along here. That's just a straightforward 5-5 five five that is not going to be worried about Glenelan Dark Mage. And just a think twice here coming from Shivitana in response. Yeah, he had options at the end of uh, Andrea's turn. He could have uh, also put a canner on the... On the Majoring Network? Majoring Network. Yeah. Card I loved in the, in the core set. Yeah, I mean, any of these lands that just mean that you can do anything at the end of turn uh, when you've been holding a little mana up. You can put storage counters on that network, gradually spend them. This, of course, kind of a variation on the storage lands that were in Time Spiral, uh, and I guess, in turn, the storage lands back from the bad old days of Magic. But Livia's Dragoon coming along here alongside some patchwork gnomes for Shmetana. So it seems like Shmetana, with those uh, gnomes, has a way of discarding cards himself, much like the... Um, Olivia's Dragoons on the other side of things. And they're definitely going to be good blockers in the face of this uh, Canker Abomination. And Andre decides to tap out that turn. So if uh, Andrea has a spell, a non-creature uh, non spell to play, he has the... Yeah, there's, that, there's open a window, window opportunity, here. Yeah. yeah. As things stand for now, Canker Abomination just getting chump blocked by that Olivia's Dragoons. He's the white mana. And it's Mona the yep. Unhallowed that he's going for. So this is a spell that generates a couple of zombie tokens. It's got flashbacks, so at some point he may be able to generate still more zombies. And the zombies will do a fair job of just widening out Mangucci's board a little bit, meaning that he can continue to uh, apply a little bit of pressure here. Also, they protect the Abomination from uh, Chino's Edict in Andre's uh, graveyard. Yeah, Chainer's Edict it only takes seven mana to flashback, and that's a very reasonable uh, ask at this point in the game. Even though Mengucci stalled a little bit on land, Smetano is doing just fine for mana. Interesting to see what Andre is doing here. He has Think Twice in the graveyard, so he might have a reason not to play it during the main phase. And a whole bunch of blocks going on here. All right. Glenel and Archmage. Coming back with Persist. All right. So that's, uh, that's a way to get rid of the tokens and uh, next turn flashbacking the, the Chainer's Edict. And Ooh, a Shriek Morn now means that 
shields down in terms of uh, being able to use that Glenlan Drak Mage anymore. This a creature-based way of killing off uh, what's going on, on the other side wow. of things. But what do we have here? Death denied. I like this one quite a bit. So Very two good. black, four colorless. Get to return four creature cards. And look at the value that's going wow. on here. Yeah. Slum Reaper to force a sacrifice on the other side of things. Get the Glenlan Drak Mage going again. All sorts of cool value coming here from Schmetana. And it's, that's one of those cards. I mean, you've spoken uh, a number of times over the course of this weekend, Raph, about how powerful Blue Black is. That yep. It just seems like there's, there's a lot of value in all of these cards. They, they, they represent kind of more than one card's worth of goodness. Yeah, and uh, it's a one for four, this one. Death Knight, one for four creatures. But the creatures he got back, also at least one for one. Glenard Archmage is uh, at least one for two. So Death the Night is about it's like crazy one for five value, yeah. or six, yeah. I mean, it, it's almost like if you think about playing a card drawing spell, only you know for a fact exactly yeah. what you're going to draw. Mm -hmm. And Patrick Groom's very good in the face of uh, Shriek Maul. Yeah, that fear ability will not impact the gnomes. They are unafraid of a strange snaky thing. Elemental. Yeah, Riley's favorite uh, French name for a card. Yeah? Hurlegueule. <laughs> there's some good French names out there for, for various bits and pieces. I mean, one of the strange things to me is there's a few cards that, there's multiple cards that have the same name in French that are different cards in English. Yeah. Which is a little unfortunate. Uh, happens every now and again. Mammoth Umbra here coming along on the Shriek Moor, meaning that it represents a much, much larger threat now, both Vigilance and a big boost to its power and toughness. But Andre has two ways to uh, make Andrea sacrifice a creature. So... For now, that Patchwork Gnome is just blocking and regenerating. The Mammoth Umbra is powerful now, but if Andrea does not have another creature, it's not going to do that much. Okay, so yeah. here's Slum Reaper. Each player is going to have to sacrifice a creature. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not going to work out super well for you there, I'm afraid, Mangucci. Uh, he could have attacked with the Archmage before playing the Slam Reaper. So unless he doesn't, he's not playing to sacrifice the, yeah. So he could have, he just missed two damage here. And if there's a Chainer's Edict here, then it's going to be an empty board. But no, just a Guild no. Mage for now. The Edict is in the, in the graveyard. All right, a bit of pressure on Mangucci's draw here. I guess that he does have the option of using Unburial Rites to get back Canker Abomination if he wants, but it's not going to be a very big Canker Abomination in the face of all of these creatures on the other oh, side of things. It's going to be a 2-2. Two, two. No, but there's uh, an Archmage as well, so that's not going to work. Uh, that's true, yeah. Exactly one blue left up for Shmetana, so he will be able to counter a non-creature spell. Like any kind of creature would uh, help Mengucci in this situation. Conviction that it's not what it... That's not what Andrea needs. I mean, it means this Shriek Moor is a little larger, but its size almost irrelevant here, given that Patchwork Gnome's, at least for now, yeah. able to block, though Smetana now completely out of cards in hand. It's going to be a big blowout. The Chainer's Edict. Yeah, both these players now on empty-handed magic, and when one player has more creatures in play, a Demir Guild Mage. No, oh, sorry. Andrea one has, I, I think Andrea has a uh, Willemux Crusher in hand. Yeah, this is going to be a blowout. And a Conviction very soon. Yeah, might as well return that Conviction to your hand. And yeah, that's a big attack as well. It's nine damage. Yeah, each of these creatures, it's not as if individually they look like they're all about being the beatdown, but when you put them all together and get to get it stuck into the red zone, they will certainly do good work. And that means that Andre Mangucci here, under the gun a little bit, has to make sure he finds something to deal with the various attackers on the other side of the battlefield. He could a flashback, yeah, the moan of the unha unhallowed, but then he's still facing Dimmer Gilmage, which, if left unchecked, is going to be ab able to uh, run away with the game. And with eight mana... Just get I rid of the remaining cards in your opponent's yeah, I hand? Think, I think get rid of the Conviction and the other card. An 8-mana Mind Rot, not exciting, but when it does mean your opponent has no more cards to work with, it may prove... Yeah, the Mind Rot that doesn't cost a card. Yeah. Or 8-mana Divination. Oh no, he decides to draw. 
which could be good as well. Both options are fine. And I've been in this situation where I was facing Dimmer Gilmage, and I was thinking, oh, if they make me discard, I'm such in a bad shape. But they always draw. It's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I guess you know what's in your deck. You know yeah. that drawing cards is good. Yeah. You don't necessarily know whether or not, with all those lands in hand, Andrea Mengucci, what's left in his hand is more land and he's just in a terrible shape, or if there's something else going on. Now, as it works out, he's now got up to four cards in hand. So it's, if you can't quite get all of the cards in your opponent's hand, it's a little bit less exciting because if there's one good bomb, you're not going to hit it. Of Dark Tidings putting still more cards in the graveyard for Mengucci. We've not really seen thus far from Mengucci a deck that feels like a, an easy 5 0. It feels like either we're seeing not the most exciting portion of his deck or he's really had to work for it to get thus far. I always thought it was Crows and not Crow. Of uh, What's the full name of Dark? Dark Tidings. Dark Tidings, yeah. I always thought it was Crows of Tide. Suddenly it depicts like more than one crow. Uh, there's a whole murder of them, I'm sure, lurking around in the background. It's just this one crow that mills you for two. Yeah. So, yeah. Here comes the discarding effect of the kill mage. And the Gurmag Angler, tidally the biggest creature on this battlefield at this point. And for Schmetana, it's not as if he's got super easy attacks here, but his board situation ought to just get better and better here as he's able to leverage that Demir Guild Mage substantially. Worth noting, of course, that as one of the members of the Magic Pro League uh, and uh, a Platinum Level Pro, Andrea Mengucci, he will have had a few buys, whereas we don't really know what the buy situation was of his opponent. So in that regard, if you had to just guess in the dark the power levels of these two decks, you probably would give the edge to the deck on okay, the right of our yeah. screen right now. So six mana not doing anything. That, that should raise the flags for uh, Andrea. Yeah, because that Dimir Guild Mage could have drawn a card there. Yep. Of course, the Guild Mage can only be used at sorcery speed. You wouldn't want to have it so that it can force discards yeah. as soon as someone draws a card. Applying kind of the full lock. There are not, there are not a lot of cards that allow that. Yeah, instant speed discard. Funeral charm? Yeah, and that's a one-off spell. Yeah. Did there... Oh, um... Call against command? Yep. Very, very few indeed. If you can get to five, I'll be quite impressed. Oh, yeah, that's good. I mean, tough. piracy charm as well works. Piracy charm, yeah. Here comes a Think Twice. Why not play the Think Twice during, uh, during Main Step? Or just draw a card from the Demir Gilmage? Especially since he had uh, an open mana. And I guess this way around he threatened more bits and pieces. Or, there were, yeah, I could see what he could have done. He could have uh, played the Think Twice with three mana open. Oh, no, never mind. It's a Glenn under uh, Archmage. No, never mind. Uh, I'm not sure why. Well, let's see what we have here from Andre Schmechana. He's still Lightdale's pretty close, but here is a big treasure cruise. He's still very much ahead here. Lots of cards in hand, plus a better board state. Yes, the life totals are pretty close, but... Mangucci's going to have to string something together. He's going to be able to get past everything that's going on on the other side of the battle. Well, there's, still, there's still the uh, Emberial Rites, right? In Andrea's... And there's still a Glenland Drock Mage yeah. To, yeah. to stymie that plan. It's, it's a, a funny little dance that's going on here between these two graveyards. Yeah, the Vessel is going to be pretty good to get rid of the Emberial Rites. Yeah, that attack was long overdue as well. Yeah, kill everything but the... Uh, the accomplice, yeah. Accomplice. Leave, leave the accomplice in play and let it hang out without being able to make a new zombie for a while. And no play this turn. Wow. Okay, so this is Andrea Mengucci setting himself up to be able to use Unburial Rites. Is he getting two life? Does he have a spell mastery? 
think Aussie he, only I think have. He may just. It's Front another a flyer. A Wingsteed rider off the top. What? Yeah, he could have played the vessel this turn, and still have the blue open for uh, for the Archmage. Yeah. Is he gonna find a? Yeah. So Ulamog's Crusher here getting returned with unburial rights. The Crusher with its Annihilator 2 and 8-8 eight, eight body can close out games even that seem difficult. I mean, right now there's a lot of land, obviously, for the, for the Crusher to deal with. And the other Flyer. 2-2 two, two Flyer, though. Oh, Scrabbler. That's what he had in hand. And he's going to get the... Not the Archmage? I mean, he's facing lethal in the air. Yeah, it seems like it would be a solid enough blocker against the Wingsteed Rider, but... Grave Scrabble alongside Patchwork Gnomes, being able to get that madness very, very easily is, is a nice one, certainly. He's holding in a, an Angel of... Uh, angel of Despair? A, angel of Despair, yes, but he doesn't have the second white. Yeah, that's... There's nothing left. There's nothing yeah. interesting left. All, all of the goodies have, yeah, they're, they're have gone. already come back out. I think taking the Shriek more is probably the right call based on what was left, but Ulamog's Crusher is going to gradually hamper things on the ground. Meanwhile, Wingsteed Rider does not need very much help, though a Flight of Fancy in hand for Andre Smetana will give him a way of uh, reasonably blocking that Wingsteed Rider. Just one time. Yeah, he needs to draw the second white mana here. And be able to uh, find a second source of white to cast the Angel of Despair. Yeah, Angel of Despair, a very, very potent threat indeed. Not the easiest of splashes, it must be said. But... Equally, you don't necessarily need to cast it super early in the game. Actually, to be good. yeah, it's often a card I play in, in the blue-black. Yeah? It's just as a reanimator target. Interesting. So given the option there, plays Flight of Fancy on oh, here's the Oh, the, here's, the, here's the second white source, but comes into play tapped. Does he play the land this turn? Oh, he did. Oh. Unfortunate sequencing of things there. So oh, murderous, murderous red, red cap. cap. That's pretty good. All that's right. actually that's actually very good because now the crusher is going to trigger the the red cap is going to come back, putting Andrea to five, and that that leaves him almost dead to the uh, to the counter attack. Yeah, I mean that crusher it does have to attack each turn. It will be able. Destroying two land, it's not too bad of a. Of a cost for Andre, who has eight, twelve, uh, eleven, twelve lands and a vessel. So he has thirteen mana. And potentially could even have had a bit wow. more. Ooh, okay, this is interesting. A mark of the vampire here does mean that that crow of uh, dark tidings is not going to die this turn. Yeah, a little bit more powerful. Well, he was not going to die anyway. This way around, though, I mean. If the main thing that you're interested in is the amount oh, yeah. of life that you can gain, then... All right, yeah. So this way he's going to be gaining four life with the Mark of the Vampire on the Crow, and the Ulmog's Crusher is going to be that much more difficult to meaningfully block. I mean, he's just going to try to kill it with uh, the Angel. That's, that's his plan. Yeah. Has he sacrificed his oh, lands what? already? I think so. Can he line up enough bodies? That's that's eleven damage to deal. It's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's that's eleven damage. All right. And regenerates the uh, patchwork gnomes. Wow, that's a lot to kill the crusher. I mean, considering that angel of despair is so close to being castable, that seems like a, uh, almost a crazy amount of yeah. I mean to throw in the bin. I mean, especially with the Dimmer Gill Mage. Dimmer Gill Mage is, gives you such an advantage in the game. Cormac Angler, yeah. And still enough cards in hand that the uh, Patchwork Gnomes will be able to continue to regenerate away. 
Mark of the Vampire does mean that Andrea Mengucci just gaining quite a bit of life over these yep. subsequent attacks. Mengucci here, considering his start, has yeah. done all right in this game. That, I mean, that, that it took game him a long time to find even a single source of white mana, let alone a second. Yeah, that game is much closer than it was supposed to be. And another flyer. Yeah, a little bit, little bit of double strike action with that Skywise Cavalry. I mean, if they were the ones with the Mark of the Vampire on, then all sorts of bother. And here's, nice cavalry, apologies. And here's the, the end burial rites I was talking about. Just drew it. Well, I mean, for this turn, he just gets to cast his big bomb. Yeah. And killing the the crows, I guess. Yeah. Get them out of the way and then gradually turn things around. The signature creature from the solar flare. Oh, look at that. It's Two flashback good. spells getting milled by the good. crow. Solar flare deck. Back in the days, the, es the first es not the first Esper deck, but well, the one, one of the early good Esper good, decks. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, reanimator spells, I mean, and I mean there was Gomar as well before that. That, Gomar, was, a, that right. was a pretty good Esper yeah. deck. Dromar the Banisher control, back in Invasion Block constructed. All right, so Mona the Unhallowed generating a couple more zombies here. Do you know why it was called Solar Flare? I do not recall. Because the Angel of Despair looks like a character in Dragon Ball Z. You no, know, <laughs> Krillin. And his, uh, his, uh, his move was the Solar Flare, you know, with the, the bolt yeah, head. I, I, I was never going to get there. I, yeah, my my power level is substantially that, lower that's than 9,000. That, that's where it comes from. That's pretty cool. All right. So once again, we have a Gomag Angler versus three less fishy zombies. And once again, Gomag Angler takes down everything but the... Uh, Ghoul Caller's Accomplice. That's a very bold move as well. The oh, no. oh, he has the colony to block the flyer if if the Gnomes was to die this turn. This has been a roller coaster ride for Andrea yeah. Mikuchi. I'm sure that there was a point in time. He thought he was winning that quite game. Quite a while ago, where he thought, well, this game will be over really quickly. And then, well, that wasn't the case. As things stand, though, while it may have taken a little bit longer. Yeah. So here's a chain of edict. I guess that this is the time for Murderous Redcap to do its thing. Are we going to see oh, a Beckham scout. apparition to... Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I could have just sacrificed the, the Redcap. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that you mind having your 1-1 yeah. one, one goblin go to the graveyard at this point. Especially if you have uh, Unburial Rites in hand and it can kill the, the flyer. Yeah. And we're on the next turn. I mean, as things stand, yeah. all of these flyers, good enough, and that enough for Andre Mengucci to pick up his cards. He will have to figure it out in games two, and indeed three, if he's going to make it a perfect 6-0 to start off his day here in Prague, locking up day two at the earliest possible opportunity. Six wins, enough to make sure that you'll be through in drafting, and Andre Smetana just needs one single game win in order to be in that spot. Let's have a little look at our standings thus far, see where we're at. We can see a number of big names here that are as yet undefeated. Andre Strasky, he won the last GP here in Prague. Uh, Pascal Viren, Tara Severin, Christopher Larsen, Mattia Rizzi, Nikolai Herzog, Hall of Famer, uh, winner of two limited Pro Tours, and at one back, point back to back. Yeah, one of one of the scariest people to draft against. Um, then we've got Tom Law in there from the UK. Um, He's a mean-looking guy too. Oh, Nikolai. Yeah. He looks terrifying, but he's just one of the loveliest people you'll <laughs> ever meet. He's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, weirdly, though, I'd known him for a long time, and then I drafted against him. And it turns out his game face, yeah, all of a sudden it's a very different uh, state of affairs. Playing against Nikolai Herzog, he is fearless. Um, very, very powerful drafter. On our second page here, Philip Krieger. We've seen him in our feature match area already. Kasper Nielsen. Uh, this is a huge, huge GP, so not a surprise to see down at 40th. Piotr Golgowski, he's done nothing wrong. The fact that he's in 40th place with an undefeated record is just a testament to how many players there are in this tournament, not to the fact that he's not doing fantastically well. He's going to have to pick up his game 40th. Ah, oh, come on. 40th is... I mean, if he continues on the same pace that he's on now, 
I think he might do better than 40th. But you know what? He hasn't lost, but he has to pick it up. Yeah, there's so many players undefeated thus far. I mean, there we go. In 60th place, Magnus Lanto on 15 points. What are you doing, Magnus? 60th place. How, how can you justify that? Samuel Estratia, Andrea Mengucci, I mean, Anna Huchenbeth. There are so many. No, that's normal. That's normal for a GP. Yeah. It's only five rounds. Come on. With five rounds in, there are, there are 60 undefeated players so far. I mean, this is a comparatively large GP. It turns yeah. out that Ultimate Masters, a pretty popular one. There were a few people that once they heard that they were going to get a chance to uh, play some Ultimate Last Masters Limited at the GP level, that they came along and to do exactly that. And gradually, we will see these... Uh, these top standings players get whittled down until ultimately we have our champion at some point tomorrow no pun intended of course on that ultimately never never a pun intended from from your man tim willoughby here and this is not at all the the line for the the champion tomorrow i mean i, have, I, mean, I have no I can't, prepared lines i can't i can't i can't talk for uh, for toby here but if someone is the ultimate champion of prague as the title of the you know this is the final article. I mean, I, I just hope that wh whoever surprised. it is that wins has the name Tim, so I can just cover up the Earl and I can cover up the eight and then just have the, their name in the middle of the name of the set. I think it'd be great. Yeah. But we'll see. Nobody knows yet. There are still plenty of great players in the room vying for that title. Um, only a few that will have already picked up the losses. That means that they're not going to be in day, day two thus far. We will gradually whittle things down, obviously, over the course of the weekend. And one will be the ultimate master. Exactly one will hoist the trophy. Yes. Looks like a mulligan here from Schmetana where uh, Menguchi a little bit happier with his opening hand this time around. We will get a chance to see him as a member of the Pro League later in the year, which will be exciting when it all kicks off. Oh, dearie me. Just casually drops a few cards there. Nothing I don't think that we hadn't seen already. Treasure Cruise. Love a Treasure Cruise. Cap. It, it's funny to me how many treasure cruises we've seen cast for six or more mana thus far in the tournament. And that really a testament to how many other useful things there are to keep in the graveyard. Um, not necessarily that big a deal to just take a turn off, draw three cards, and leave all of that value there for later. I believe he cast it for, for six or eight because he did not have anything left in his graveyard because he used them already for uh, Gourmet Angler. All right, so we're going to get a turn one Celestial Colonnades. The mana's looking pretty decent here. If there's ah, a second Ah, no, there's land. a Terramorphic Expense as well. Looks like a vessel there uh, on the top of the deck, so maybe not cracking that uh, Expense on turn one. Andrea on his full grip. Looking to get revenge after a, a kind of weird game one. Ancient Tomb. Ancient Tomb? Look at this. He's still got a mana floating. Oh, no, sorry. No, that's no, no, it's cost, it's cost too many. Yeah. Yeah. I like Ancient Tomb quite a bit. It's one of those cards that when you first see it, having to pay uh, two... Wow. Uh, four to mana, two mana. Two. Uh, that's... Uh, ah, now who's got the Archmage, says Menguchi. You know why? This is a little... Uh, this is this more is, of a 5-0 this, start. This is the, but this is a little disappointing. Come on. You have four mana on turn two. You play like a 5-3, right? I mean, five, I would, a five, certainly. A 5-3 Golem, right? Yeah. That makes all the spells more expensive. Yeah, a Lodestone Golem, that's how yeah, we do Lodestone it. Yeah, Lodestone Golem. Oh, just a 2-2, two, two, that's, that's a little... Uh, and that's a little endless rest there coming down, so... Yeah. From here on out, Menguchi threatening to just casually use that Glenelander Archmage to cap, uh, counter a few things. But for now, it also gets to get stuck into the red zone. Here is Crow of Dark Tidings. Just the two lands going to the graveyard there. Yeah, deciding to uh, take two damage to keep a blue mana up. Yeah, at some point that mana, that uh, damage will rack up, but Menguchi hoping presumably to be able to get enough going with the mana early on that it's not a problem. unafraid of getting into the red zone here. We may see some Archmage on Archmage battles, but Beckon Apparition oh, wow. here just to generate an additional blocker. It's pretty good at one flyer. Yeah. So one mana removal here. And the Beckon Apparition, I'm guessing that this is a sideboard card that got brought in having seen the likes of Unburial Rites and various flashback cards for this matchup. But here just killing off the, the Crow yeah. seems perfectly solid. So Andrea could... Uh, 
just scanner it, but still, that's that's not great. Yeah, and a whole bunch of blocks here. There'll be some milling. There'll be some persisting. This is not necessarily how Manguchi would have drawn it up. Yeah, with that draw, you want you want to rely on your on your early early uh, plays because now the six life invested. Yeah, the, having having to play more things just to get through this turn. A little unfortunate there. Dark dabbling to regenerate and draw a card. It feels like all the all the life invested in the early plays of Menguchi are just they're just not paying off that much. Deranged assistant now coming down. That's eight life invested and Andre is still on eighteen and Andrea does not have that much of a lead in yeah, I mean, arguably, Demir Guildmage at this point the most potent threat on the battlefield. An ancient tomb, obviously powerful. When when you get to accelerate, essentially for free, um, and until that life becomes a problem, it really is free. Um, very powerful, but yeah, not enough have been done with it in the early stages of this game, and all of these Glenelg Arch Mages. They've just been in a big old fight. It's been fairy on fairy violence, and it's not something I can really condone. The yeah, Andreas game two without the white seems probably a little more uh, adapted to this matchup. Kanker Abomination getting milled there by the Derange Assistant. And in a deck like Andreas, I can easily imagine that he will be activating Derange Assistant even if he doesn't have something to readily use the mana on because cards in the graveyard, uh, they're not quite as good as cards that you draw, but they certainly have potential value for him in the future. As a flight of fancy draws a couple more cards for Menguchi. Another hit from uh, Ancient Tomb. More Crows of Dark Tidings. Nothing of relevance here. A zombie bird there, the Crow of Dark Tidings. Flight of fancy all round. The old Ravnica pairing coming along again in Ultimate Masters. Both those cards originally printed in the first printing of Ravnica. Ravnica Sit of Guilt. That's the one. Somewhere that's been visited uh, a few times now, and indeed even visited in Dungeons and Dragons. For those of you that like to roll your D20s rather than using the keep track of your life total, uh, the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica is kind of a fun addition to DD. Andre is on 10, so he can't really mess, mess around. Yeah, he's, he's got to just sort of try and make this a good old-fashioned race. Gets in with both of these Crows of Dark Tidings, offers up the trade, and Smetana take it, takes it there, but wow. in some respects, I feel like just keeping the Dimir Guild Rage around might have been okay, at least for another turn. I guess this potentially speaks to the power in Andre's hand. Yeah, this is a little scary. Another damage. He, he, just, no. he just loves tapping that ancient yeah. team. I mean, why would you not? I mean, in Legacy, it's well, most likely the only land you have, so along with Seed of Traitors. And Andre is uh, an avid. Oh, he legacy loves his player. Legacy, yeah. yeah. Castle of the Unhallowed, just keeping the ancient tomb up there. Discretion, the better part of Valak. And he is the one that has got the damage on the battlefield here. Uh, yeah, Andre. Andre has a the zombies. has a colonnade as well. So, a couple hits of of colonnade of the of the land could be uh, really good. Slum Reaper here. I'm not excited by. Uh, four mana getting rid of a zombie. That's it's a little underpowered. But I think he has a death denied as well. So, I think he's setting up to. Uh, to get a big a big payoff later yeah. and he's only facing three damage so it's not like it's too big of a deal and rune snag in his hand not not doing a whole whole bunch here yeah if there's one thing that andre manguchi has it is mana at this stage in the game now do we think this is a full transformation that we see from Ooh. andre manguchi after yeah. sideboarding he's got a lot of blue cards that we just simply didn't see in game one Wow, did he just use the... <gasps> Is he on 8? He can just so. attack twice with the colonnade and win. 
There's no flyers. There's no flyer, and he's not dead on board, right? Two, four, six, seven. Wow. Smetana just passes, though. I mean, this is the sort of thing that gives Manguchi the time to swing for the win here. I think Andre, I think Andre is on eight and not on ten. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. he would he would have won the colonnade right here. He could have attacked twice and oh yeah, no, no, never, never mind. He has the assistant that flies. Yes. All right. So here's this big death knight. We anticipated that there might be a few creatures coming back. This seems exactly the case. Oh wow! Foil. Foiled again. You don't always have to play it by its alternate mana cost. Sometimes it's just a four mana counter spell, and there it was a big one because that was something that Smetana had been playing around to try and set up for a while. Yeah, but now and it's just foiled. Yeah. It's Poor timing was his consistent mistake. Yeah, the discard, the discard uh, aspect of discard comes handy with the uh, madness and with the uh, reanimator targets. Oh, yeah. I like it with reanimator yeah. a lot. So think twice here, allowing Smetana to build his own divination, albeit at a somewhat higher cost. Just checking out what's in his opponent's graveyard. Are we going to see a reanimate here? With nine life, that seems a little, a little bullish. A miraculous recovery. Does, uh, no, it's only a new... It's your graveyard. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What did he draw? And burial rights. And Barrel Rights is interesting. Potentially gets to use both halves of that at some point. If he's playing on Burial Rights this turn, that means that he's not activating his Celestial Colonnade, though, I don't think. So for now, at least, we've got a Meringue Real Prowler just sort of showing due respect to Celestial Colonnade as the only attacker. All right, so... Hexproof, a pretty powerful ability in these sorts of matchups. Uh, getting to together that um, Whirlwind Adept. And then following it up oh, with wow. Mark of the Vampire. I mean, Mark of the Vampire on a Whirlwind Adept is a great way of swinging a race. Rune Finally, snag. Rune Snag for two damage. <laughs> I mean, that's one way of doing it. I yeah. kind of like it. I mean, it's, it's probably as good as you're going to get. Um, a full snout. And that'll be the reason that uh, Shmetano was checking out what was in uh, Menguchi's graveyard, I would suppose. So, no target? It's when it leaves the battlefield, so... Oh, right, right, right. He didn't evoke it, he just played it. Very strange-looking little elemental piggy slug. Thing. It's a pig slug. Plug. Plug, yeah, slick. Any of the above. Uh, so... Unbarrel rights here, getting back Glenelendra Archmage and uh, Slum Reaper there. Yeah, as soon as Andrea and taps with uh, with the four two, the adept, and mark the vampire. Just cast this Meringue River Pile again. That the reason that that was the one that he sacrificed. Didn't want to lose. Any amount of his board can help it. All you need is a black or a green permanent. You can cast that Meringue Rule of Power straight out your graveyard. And he does have black permanents. He's got a few. I like these attacks here from Andre Mangucci. Yeah, he's not he's not dying on the on the attack back. He's gonna gain at least six life. And there's not twelve power on the on the east side of the board. Oh. Oh no, he's gonna get he's gonna get into life. Yeah, no no sneaky sacrifices yeah. here, I don't, I don't no, believe. No no good blocks here. To improve the situation. He needs to find a way to deal with the the marauder. Yeah, the life turtles swinging just a little bit. Uh, and ultimately Andre Mangucci finding the win there in game two. 1-1. One, 1-1 one. One, one indeed. And the sideboarding there for Mengucci, pretty substantial, we think. He was he appeared to be black-white in game one and black-blue after sideboard. Um, that one of the cool things, I guess, about this format is that because the overall power level of cards is pretty high, it means that there is at least the potential, assuming that you've got um, 
if, that you weren't able to build a deck that was just splashing a lot that you can just mm. full on change colours between games yeah. when you do you can definitely catch opponents a little bit flat footed especially if you've planned it out so that you can make that sideboarding pretty quick I mean you can you can have a lot of different decks from your steel deck sometimes it's just impossible to build two decks mm -hmm. but in this format it feels like even though you have you might not have like two good decks you're definitely able to build two or three different decks sometimes yeah. they're just the same level or more adapted to your opponent's deck I think that it's, it's easy to get a sense of maybe how fast or slow your opponent's deck is and have a sideboard plan that is uh, geared around that a little bit or maybe how interactive or not they might be with your graveyard and we saw that, I mean, it's, it was fortunate in many respects for Shmetana that he played Beckon Apparition when he did because he wasn't going to get nearly as much value in game two with it as he could have in game one. And it just meant that uh, he was able to set up at least a nice set of trades. So Olivia's things regained. kicking off here in game three. And it's Olivia's Dragoon versus Direct range assistant these two with very different roles on the battlefield the dragoon getting stuck in where it can and of course potentially setting up some good early uh, reanimation meanwhile deranged assistant it gets things in the graveyard just straight off the top of the deck rather than from hand the dragoons of course also working kind of nicely with madness and there's that ancient tomb wow. again so turn three one two three four five mana oh wow Whirlpool Adept, I mean, this is going to potentially do a fair amount here. Awful Snout coming down with Flash at the end of turn. Lenalendra Archmage in hand here. Yeah, attacking with both seems, seems good. Get that damage in, yeah. Yeah. Baff. And then Gucci will be hurting himself with that Ancient Tomb, so yeah. Putting yourself in a racing position definitely interesting and Glenelandra Archmage amongst the various things that it can do pretty solid blocker Slam Reaper could have been good here I mean he doesn't really need the, the awful snout here and yep. he has a flight of fancy as well so that would have been like four damage in the air and also keeping Andrea from uh, making mana with the Dirge Assistant and making him use his uh, Ancient tomb. tomb as much as possible yeah. it's, it's big game it's a sneaky extra path to victory yeah. graph. that's what it is and here we see the Ancient Tomb being tapped so lots of mana again this allowing a Shriek more on the uh, Glenelandra Archmage dealing with the first half of it thanks to the Persist bringing it back the Shriek Moor's fear ability that it can't be blocked except by artifacts or black creatures. Not so relevant in this matchup, but it's still just a really solid uh, removal spell. So yeah, here you play the you play the slum. Sl huh. Or just uh, yeah, you have you have a few ways to actually do it. So Flight of Fancy here on Awful Snouts. You you could have played the the Slum Reaper first to uh, have Andrea sacrifice a creature and attack with three uh, in the air. And then next turn, play Flight of Fancy on the, on the Slum Reaper. And then attack for 7. That would have been 10 as well. I mean, as it stands, this is 3 flyers getting in, putting in Menguchi to 5. Yeah, he he's got an Ancient Tomb in play that he's yeah. going to be loath to tap at this point, because that's essentially another creature attacking him. Um, and there's the and handshake. Yeah. Andre Shmatana, congratulations to you. You've just made it through today too by taking down one of the 32 that are in the Magic Pro League. Good job to you and Menguchi. Well, if he wants to find his sixth win, he's going to have to find it in a different round because this round, well, couldn't get there. So that is the first of our win and in matches for round six. But you know what, Raf? I think that we may get a chance to fit in just a little bit more magic over the course of this round. We've got a few other good, good names in our feature match area. Do not go anywhere, guys. We'll have more magic for you after these messages.
welcome back to this round six here at Grand Prix Prague, happening at Magic Fest Prague. I'm Tim Willoughby, this is Raphael Levy, and we are in our win and in stages. Six wins gets you into the draft portion of Grand Prix Prague, and you know what? We've got our feature match area full of 5-0 players. That means that we are really, really close to having our first drafters all locked up, and with a tournament this big, there are a lot of players at that 5-0 record thus far. I believe that we're around 60 or so at least uh, players that we have on 5-0 and some of that raw talent we have in our feature match area that we're going to get a chance to show you in a time walk fashion. Obviously our main match has now been completed. We're going to get a chance to see Torov Severin and Alexa Telerov. They're in their game two. Uh, Telerov picked up game one already uh, just so that we can make sure we fit in the conclusion of this match kicking things off a little ways through and oh, look at a this. mana vault on turn one for Alexa Telerov. That's one way of getting to 5-0. and So we, we had uh, Enchant 2 that did not work out as uh, as planned for Andrea on his side. Let's see what mana vault does. Mana vault does a lot because this is five mana available potentially on turn two here for Alexa Telerov and if you can't find a five drop that outclasses those Olivia's Dragoons then quite frankly what this. is going on? Just heard that there's 129 people currently undefeated in the tournament. That will cut roughly in half um, as we get to this next round. Uh, and so half of them will be making it into day two this ne very next round. Canker Abomination, though, is a 5-5. Five, 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 that sound remind, reminds me of a uh, turn one Sol Ring, turn two uh, Juice Engine. Yeah. And, and exactly, exactly the same. Yeah, you you lose the, the damage. Yeah, yeah, you lose one on your turn. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. Well, Juzam Jin was pretty good. It took people a while to really realize quite how good, just because like there were some people that were afraid of that damage. It turns out yeah. often utterly irrelevant. Um, no, it's not. It's not that good. Yeah, it was. It was printed and was not very good. It yeah. was never played. Played it's sliver. It's kind of sad. Yeah. Good against the sliver decks rather than in them. But for now, uh, Telerov needs to decide whether or not. He is willing to trade that Canker Abomination for Olivia's Dragoons and half of a Kitchen Fix. Man, it's really sad. The Juzam never got a chance to show his worth to the, the next generation of Magic players. Man, imagine if they, it wasn't printed as a Juzam Jin. Oh, oh. Sadly, unlikely to happen anytime soon. But you know what? The artwork from Mark Didin on uh, Juzam Jin will live on forever in many, many memories. Just one of the most fantastic bits of artwork you've seen in the whole of Magic. And Murderous Redcap here, working in Finish tandem off. with Kitchen Finks for some Persist-related shenanigans. Just the wind, though, says that the Canker Abomination coming back, though I'm guessing it's not going to get cast yeah. particularly soon because Isn't with three creatures on the other side of the battlefield, it's a much less exciting creature to throw down. It's, uh, it's a very long-term... Uh, oh, no, maybe not. Long-term plan. 4 mana 3-3. Three, 3-3 three. Three, three being exactly the right size oh, to get wow, hit by a last gasp. And Toralf Severin. That's a great came draw. To play. It's a great draw. Just going to get stuck right in there. Telerov here, ever since using that mana vault on, uh, on the second turn, has just been taking damage from it. Elects to take damage from it again here because, I mean, ultimately, if he's yeah. spending all that mana to untap, then he's taking a lot of damage from the various creatures on the battlefield. But he's going to really rough shape now. Oh, now, yes, because Torolf is drawing two cards a turn thanks to the, the Snake Umbra. Yeah. Makes, uh, makes his uh, creature not exactly an Ophidian, but back in, like, one of the first creatures like this. I think the first creature was a, was a snake. Yeah, I mean, Ophidi would, Ophidian certainly was a snake. Yeah. Um, the first creature that would attack and if unblocked, draw you a card that was Ophidian. Yes, which was a snake. Which was a snake, yes. It looked like a, a, a person yeah a little, little snake whispering in a person's ear but yeah I, I, I never thought I never it took me a while to realize it was actually the snake the Dan Dan effect as we refer yeah. to it it's not Dan Dan is not a boat Dan Dan is not a boat we heard it here first guys we cracked that code so a big old spider coming down for Telerov so that will help uh, with some of the blocking duties even if Olivia's de Grunes decides that it wants to go to the air reach on that spider will do good work and that gives Tor Toral Severin a little bit of pause here as he tries to figure out how he wants to proceed yeah Torf can still attack here attack with the team if the spider blocks the kitchen things or the red cap that's still four damage four or five damage in and the card netted so yeah totem armor means that it's really not so much of a worry to uh, get those attacks in no, but like if if he, if he decides to block the the dragoon, 
the, the, so how about a bore umbra to change this math? A what? A bore umbra. A bore umbra, yeah, that, that, that will change a few things. Because that's what Toral Severin's considering right now. So what do you put it on? The knight or the, the red cap? I kind of like it on the knight here. Just make the knight as scary as it can possibly yeah. be. Force the, force the, the chump. Bit of a problem faced by Alexa Teller off here. I mean, yeah, the, if Alexa has another just to win, it's not as good as putting it on a murderous red cap. That is true. That's certainly a concern. As things stand, Alexa there killing off what he can for the smallest downside. So Kitchen Fink's getting killed. Oh, he's on two now. And now he has to pay yeah, for that uh, mana vault just so that he's not being killed off by his own artifacts. Oh, wow. Kitchen Fink's coming along to save the day. Back in the days, he would burn for two at this point. Well, we're not in that world anymore, Raph. Yeah. It's a brave new world now. We've got Magic Arena, you know. Yeah. It's lovely. So, Tellerov here still, let us be completely clear on this, not looking in great shape against the terrifyingly large uh, Olivia's Dragoons in control of Toral Severin here. Nice. He's probably going to fly and... Uh And trade, no, and not trade, and ask for a, a chum block from. Uh, oh, look at this. Gold Guy Grave Troll. Yeah, discarding your Grave Troll to Olivia's Dragoons just to set up some potential shenanigans yeah. going forward. Do you know the card type of a Gold Guy Grave Troll? Uh, I think it used to be Troll. Yes. It's not. Which would make sense. It's Skeletons. Yeah, or? it's Skeleton Troll now. Yeah. All right, so we're going to get on to a game three here. It's interesting that the troll is a skeleton, not a zombie as well. Yeah. I'm sure that that was a very careful choice by the design team. But there are zombie trolls, right? Yeah, probably. How about the... What's, what's his name? Lotleth troll, maybe? Oh, yeah, Lotleth troll is a zombie troll. And the other one, the, what's his name? The three mana, two, two, makes all your creatures scavenge. Yes. Yeah, it seems like that. I can't remember the name. But yes. Satya Wayfinder here, finding a land for Toralf, putting a Canker Abomination and a Wicker Bow Elder in the graveyard as well. Fire Ice is enough to tap down, in that case, the forest of Toralf Severin. That Alexa Tellerov just trying to slow down what's going on there. He could have used fire to kill off the Satya Wayfinder, but to be honest, the Wayfinder's done its work. And no, not even, it's not uh, Varold's. The scar is stripped. Stripe. The scar is troll striped. warrior? It's a troll warrior. It's not a troll zombie. All right. Canker Abomination at full strength here. Getting sent back to Toral Severin's hand by Just the Wind. Oh, Skazback Marauders here coming along. Persist all over the place. So far, Mana Vault, Ancient Tomb, not doing too, too good of a, of a job. It turns out that, yeah... 13-year-old Tim was correct that all of this damage is yeah. a bad idea. Canker Abomination this time around coming as a 5-5. I mean, if it doesn't power a Brin Geyser, like, what, what is it good for? Mind Twist. Yeah. Oh, Mind Twist, yeah. Yeah. Woo! Those were the days. Yeah, now we just cast 5-5s five on turn 2. Kadama's Reach coming along, helping out Alexa Tellerov's mana just a little bit. Speaking of mana, I thought that I may have seen... And we'll, we'll get a chance to double check soon enough in Toralf Severin's hand. A plane's lurking in there, suggesting Plane. that he's got a cheeky little splash going on somewhere within his 40. I would expect it, and burial rights. And that's, that's the cleanest flashback spell that I can immediately think of that he yeah. might be running. Yeah, especially with uh, Golgik Rave Troll. Look at this, mountain. Four colors for Tellerov. I like it, I can dig it. I mean, you see there's uh, the fire ice in the graveyard, so that's... a. Uh, at least one of the red spells. Also cast uh, the the Goblin Warrior. All right. Well, here's a murderous red cap. Target acquired. It's pretty good. Putting a minus one. Technically, putting a minus one, minus one counter on the five two, so it can't trade for a. It's missed. It was all missed all along. So 
Astros. Huh. Still getting stuck in there, getting some damage where he can. So why why not just blo uh, block first and then miss? So he saves uh, five damage. It's a great question. It's not one I got a great answer for. I'm afraid there, Raf. I mean, he would have come back with uh, zero minus one minus one counters. All right, Med red cap on red cap action. The second shoots down the first, which comes back with persist. Not quite sure. I don't know. Went, just went straight to Alexa there. No great targets. It's a lot of cars in Seoul, Sam. I think he's got a wild mongrel to work yep. with as well. So in terms of piecing together everything that he needs for maybe a reanimation plan, he can do some cool stuff. But equally, he could just make that dog real large and get into the red zone. It's a big dog. Big old dog. He teaches you how to play, bet, play dead. All right, everyone coming into the red zone now for Severin. That's the flavor text, right? It is the flavor text. Yeah. It's good flavor text. There's, there's yeah, been like some, some like nice it. flavor text uh, like it. In, uh, in the history of Magic and in, indeed flavor text updates in Ultimate Masters in some cases. Well, Wild Mongrel was, uh, was a huge card back in the days. Absolutely, yeah. Um, setting up the original madness, but also just making life very, very difficult for opponents that want to get anything much done here. So here comes the Mongrel, and there is an Unburial Rites in hand. So Unburial Rites naturally costs five. Its flashback costs four, though, meaning that if Severin wanted to set up something big here, he absolutely could, but he would, in so doing, be making it so that he wasn't able to uh, cast the big reanimation spell twice. Finds the fifth land. Wild Mongrel here. It's a lot of lands on there. Alexa's side. On the table. Wild Mongrel looks so innocuous. On the face of things, you know, it's just this 2-2 two -two that sometimes gets a little bigger, but you have to discard cards, and discarding cards is bad. Well, Noose Constrictor was a little better. It's, it was different. It's not exactly a, a reprint. A yeah. reprint with uh, an upside. Because uh, the color, it can change color. This is, this is a... A line that's often yeah. forgotten I'm under sure Wild Mongrel. I'm sure every now and again, somewhere in the room, someone has attacked a Shriek more into Wild Mongrel yeah. and found that it didn't work out quite how they'd hoped. Yeah. Is it the only the use of it in this format? There's probably a few other bits and bobs. Um, but that, that's the one that most immediately comes to mind is, yeah. as a meaningful interaction for the, the color ability on uh, Wild Mongrel. Oh, God's Willing as well. Yep. Like if your opponent attacks and plays God Willing Protection from Green, you can uh, change the Mongol's colors. I, I don't know how it works. I don't know yeah, why. I would, I would love to understand how this yeah. how this dog is. You know, it, it's been out in the wild, and the thing that it has learned it's is to, to a be chameleonic yeah. ability. Then it would be a mutant dog. Mutant. I, hound. I feel like if the Simic could capture a wild mongrel, yeah. they would have a wild time with it. It would be a chameleon dog frog lizard, something. It would, it'd, it'd be an ooze. And it would still be 2-2 two, two for 2. Oh, yeah, 100%. And do the exact same thing. Yes. If, for those of you in the chat that want to sound off with the exact uh, name and creature types of Wild Mongrel, if it was a Simic card, yeah. please let us know. The world needs to know. So Toroff here... Even though he's got the advantage in life, he's not got so obvious a set of lines here as he had mere moments ago. Talarov gradually building out that board. He has a lot of cards in hand, though. An and holy, and holy hunger as well. Kadama's reach, just to make sure that he can get the mana sorted. But also in the process, he has to look through his deck and just get a feel for if there's anything that he could be preparing for with that unburial rights, potentially. But also adding a, a spell. A sorcerer in his uh, graveyard. Yep, sets so things up a little easier yep. to get spell mastery. Okay, suspicious looking dog hitting the red zone. Yeah, trading for a, a 4 1 goblin. So it seems a bit of an ask for Taraf Severin to discard four cards. Yeah, I've seen it done. One of my favorite things that used to happen back in the day with um, Wild Mongrel was my opponent would cast one and I'd cast a Volcanic Hammer at it when I had maybe two more mana up and they have to then decide what they want to do. So here we go. Twins of Mara State getting discarded and cast via Madness uh, from the Wild Mongrel. 
but then still the trade happening. Were their parents? The twins? Nobody knows. Well, that was maybe the, maybe the twins know. Th- those were they are vampires. Those were the last words of uh, whoever is dead on the picture. More That's also the flavor text. I like it. Flavor text theatre here at Grand Prix Prague as Ulamog's Crusher comes down for Alexei Telerov. This one, a big threat. Um, it attacks each turn. It's an 8 8, and with Annihilator 2, it will gradually whittle down everything that Taral Severin's worked so hard to build. But for the fact that there is removal ready, and that means Twins of Mara State, suddenly the largest creatures on this battlefield, getting stuck in here, doing a little bit of damage to Telerov on attacks. I mean, just like the Crusher's master, the Crusher is very hungry. Oh, yeah. I mean, that whole household. Yeah, they, they, they just need to get down the shops, get some food. Actually, get it down. Maybe they have the food, but they'd never eat. <laughs> no, they can never decide who's going to yeah. do the cooking. Oh, yeah, so it's just like. I, I've it's been just, in it's just like just the like story that. of the, the donkey that doesn't drink because uh, it's a whole story like this. It doesn't know what to eat, so it just dies of hunger, starvation. It's a, it's a tough one. Cathodian uh, joining the team for Severin here, the 3 3 for 3. Gets played in a lot of decks, really very little downside to playing the 3 3, and occasional upside also. Hooting Mandrel's getting cast for Alexa Telerov, who keeps most of his cards in his graveyard, sees them more valuable there potentially for later. Very nice pickup from uh, Turolf here. A shed weakness. Very good with the uh, murderous red cap. Oh, yeah. The red cap would be 4 4, and then, and then if it dies, it will still come back. Okay, now who's got the crusher? Toral Severin has. Is this one going to be hungry? Well, I mean, if it is, then it might get dug up again with unburial rights. You know, it would be funny if it was actually if there was a thirst in the format. <laughs> tap it, tap it down. Time to feed. Time to feed, yeah. Well, time to feed, like to devouring greed. Devouring greed, oh yeah. This is just making me hungry now. What are we, what are we having for dinner? All right, big attacks here coming from Toral Severin. So the first thing that's going to happen is Annihilator 2. Two permanents going to have to go into Alexa Telerov's graveyard here just because of that uh, Ulamog's Crusher getting into the red zone. Yeah, that shit weakness is, uh, is going to be pretty efficient here. I mean, if you're Severin as well, you do also know that if things go awful, awfully wrong you here... You still have Unburial Rights. You have Unburial Rights to get back yeah. not one but two of these creatures if needed. I'd feel pretty confident if I was uh, Torolf here. Severin, a regular on the, uh, the circuit here at Grand Prix around Europe. He's also recording uh, videos with our uh, colleague. Our esteemed Riley coverage co- yeah. colleague, Riley Knight. Yeah, definitely worth checking the, those out. The Arena Boys. Yeah. Enjoying that arena action. Two forests are getting sacrificed there to the Ulmogs Crusher. Still a couple left in place, so no big hurt there. And now come the blocks. 8-8 eight, eight is a big one if you want to actually block and trade with it. Yeah, there's no real good block here. Yeah, just, just survive for now. Actually, he can play Shed Weakness in the Cathodian. Oh, well, I don't know about that one. Yeah, the red cap can die, and then... I mean, what about Shed Weakness on the Twins of Marrow State? Let your red cap die yeah. and unburial rights it. That, that would work. That would be five. Eh, I guess it's just fine like this. Oh, yeah, that works. That works even better. Yep, yep. The because murderous red cap deals damage equal to its power. power. Yep. So it's with the played. ability on the stack, pump it by two. All of a sudden, that's a four-point burn spell. That's enough to close things out. And Terrell Severin, congratulations to him. Six wins means that he will be drafting tomorrow. It's just a question now of whether or not he can make it a good clean eight and find himself right at the top of the standings as we go to things. We will have more for you soon enough. But do not go anywhere. Magic after these messages. <laughs> 